Welcome to the Fundraising Elevator, where we're all headed up. This podcast is a production of ElevateNonprofit.com, an online learning platform for fundraising event professionals. We're coming to you today from the studios of the AV department. Please welcome our hosts, Kristen Steele and Samantha Swaim. Hello, and welcome to the Fundraising Elevator. We are so excited because today we are here with one of our favorites, our fun favorites, our deep, meaningful favorites in the sector, (laughs) Shannon Doolittle. She is also a fellow Pacific Northwesterner, so there's that. Um, Today we want to talk a little bit about, well, not a little bit, a lot. Today we want to talk a lot about um, what Shannon would like to tell us about themes for events and how that can tie all of the pieces together. But before we do that, let's be official. Sam, Let's introduce Shannon. Bio, please. All right. Shannon Doolittle is a fundraising strategist and mentor with a specialty area in events. She's an expert in the art of surprise and delight and says that if she wasn't a fundraising strategist, she would be a civics teacher encouraging kiddos to make their communities a better place. She has helped hundreds of nonprofits raise lots of money through events, direct mail campaigns, and storytelling. And her newest passion and focus is on legacy giving. She is also one of the thought leaders behind one of our favorite conferences, the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference, which is in San Diego this year. And Kristen and I hope to see everyone there. Shannon, welcome to the Fundraising Elevator. We're so glad to have you. Thank you. I always love bios. They make me sound so official and like I'm an expert. I, everyone needs bios, I think. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yes. Hi, yes. friends. Hello, hello. And hi, podcast friends. Well, we want to start with the big picture question, the like Shannon Doolittle TED Talk question, which is every good event is a story. So tell us, how does a theme help us shape our story? Well, it was funny. That's a great question. And it was funny because it was sort of how Kristen started when she said, Shannon, deep, meaning one of those meaningful friends. And that's what I think about what themes are for your events and why it makes storytelling so much easy for you because themes add depth. They add Mm -hmm. meaning. They add resonance, right? They make uh, things relatable to your audience. Um, And more importantly, it just makes the whole process of events a whole lot more fun. (laughs) So (laughs) I think when we spend as many hours as we do um, thinking about just, you know, guest names, making sure that the spelling is correct all the way down to, you know, making sure that the script times are right or whatever else. You got to have some fun in there. And that's where a really great theme just encourages you to keep going creatively. But also, more importantly, it just really ties everything together. And I think for me, themes just help provide structure. um, And when it comes to your narrative at an event, it just helps you maintain consistency. And we can talk about like what that looks like. But overall, themes, I think, are one, just fun and two, just really give you an outline that you get to work with at all different parts of the planning, um, even post-event too, which we'll talk mm. about, I'm sure. Let's talk about all of those things. So <laughs> yeah. um, sort of at the top, can you talk a little bit about conceptually theme and mm-hmm. perhaps my missions or my organization's mission and how we actually conceptually bring those into alignment from the jump so that the theme doesn't become a throwaway and also doesn't become a distraction? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think the best way that I can do this is probably give an example of two of how that kind of works, Um, because themes can be problematic, which we'll also talk about. Um, But when it comes to your organization, I think a lot of us have the annual event that we do. Usually there's like a name attached to it. Maybe it's like bridging communities or gift of health, you know, or something like that. And that really that that name that you give it on an annual basis is really all about sort of connecting your mission to what you're trying to do. Um, Theme lets you go a little bit deeper into it, but you would always want to make sure that your theme is connected to your mission. So for instance, I was thinking um, kind of right before the podcast about a couple of ways that this comes to life. One of those was for an event that I did for a very large healthcare organization, one of my favorite events. Um, it was all about exploration. And we were up in Seattle, yay, PNW, um, which is the Emerald City. So we thought we were raising money for our new Neurosciences Institute, which is all about research and discovering new um, potential ways that we can thwart certain diseases um, in that neurosciences realm. Um, and that is fraught with its own issues, right? 
right? <laughs> um, as you're raising money for things. And so what we decided to do was sort of do this journey to the Emerald City theme. Um, so the whole point of it was you were an explorer along with us that started in sort of the event invitation with maps, with things that you were doing. Um, so as you were going, even into when you got to sort of that FAQ right before you came, you were following along with this particular character, this explorer that we created that you were alongside with. Um, so that when you came to the event, the things that you got to hear about was the journey of being an adventurer. Um, and how did that look in terms of the room? Uh, you know, the room looked like you were kind of in a little bit more of a jungle setting. You know, we had a lot of flora, we had a lot of fauna, but more importantly, you know, the room was very much, you know, kind of that green, that very, like, what would an Emerald City look like if you were ju just discovering it? Um, but in terms of how it connects to the mission, for for us, it was really all about the storytelling that we told during the event. So one of the things, um, this is just one little example, um, In when we very first got on stage with our executive director who started us off, it's a fundraising event. And one of the things that we know about explorers in the 1800s and 1900s is nobody wanted to fund them, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, for you guys, this is, a, this is something that we've been dealing with for a very long time. Um, and so part of that was there was discovery in sort of being one of the founding sort of thought leaders around what would it look like to discover new technologies? Um, and also what happens after with some of these explorers that then came back and discover new worlds or new medicines, things that created, you know, new life and new possibility for people um, around the world. And that was kind of why we're all in that room together. Like this is the beginning of discovery and insight that potentially, right, could lead to some pretty phenomenal world changing things down the road. So that's kind of like just an example. Like another example I'll give too is um, we did a breakfast event for a, an, it was an elementary literacy program, which I, I anytime you're going to get me into books, I'm going to love it. But <laughs> The theme really was around, we did an Oh, the Places You'll Go theme with Dr. Seuss. So it was all around the theme of Dr. Seuss, the colorways, just think those pastel -y bright colors that were included in invitations and things to get people sort of a nostalgic view of like, oh, I remember sort of Dr. Seuss when I was younger. But more importantly, as you got to the event and the people on stage, each speaker read sort of a different page from the book as you went through the event. And one of my favorite things is even at the end, I can't, I was bad. I should have looked this up, but I think even at the end, it's like, um, something about, and on oh, the mountains, now you go. It's basically like the, it's your turn. You're out of here. And it worked out perfectly because that's the message you give at the end. Like we're done here at the event, but now we're off. You go, you know, thank you for being here. So it was just the way that the book lined up and some of the theme that was in the book. So the, like the five speakers that stood up each had a point in the book that they were referring to as they went that tied back to what story they were bringing um, into the breakfast that morning morning. So I hope that's helpful. Is that helpful? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think what I love about both of those examples is you're leaning into sort of pieces of the guest experience that they bring with them yeah. to the event mm -hmm. in a really specific way. So I'm thinking about the Explorer theme, and I'm thinking about how you're actually not only connecting the donor to outcomes potentially down the road in this mm -hmm. research, but you're also bringing them in to have an imagination about what the process of research is like um, mm -hmm. and bringing an understanding to that that could be a lot of jargon and data otherwise, but sort of experientially <laughs> tapping into that idea of it being this process, right? But also full of excitement and potential and all of those things. And also on the book piece, I love the idea of, of understanding that people bring nostalgia with them. People bring yeah. stories with them and experiences with them. And where can we shortcut to get impact and emotional connection in that way? I wanted to follow up because you said a great thing in the invite and talk <laughs> about, right, there's a whole experience that happens outside of that room before and after. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about theme and invite and what that, we spend a lot of time thinking about Priya Parker and sort of the, the invite is that first touch point in a lot of mm -hmm. ways. Um, and can you talk a little bit, because we've had this conversation and I would love for mm -hmm. people to hear it about the importance of the invite and what that is and what you what you're actually bringing donors into and what that can look like. 
I love it. I have said, and we've all been doing this for a long time. At least the three of us have. Yeah. Um, and the party starts in the mailbox. I always like to, um, to put that out there. I mean, that is the first impression that people get. And, you know, the way that we think about um, uh, uh, invitations is normally you think, okay, like I've got to get the save the Dave out, right? Then I got to get the invite out. Then maybe I have to get the reminder postcard out. You think of them in terms of those three linear things that need to happen, which is great. However, What you also want to be thinking about is what's the message that should go into those three and how can I do that in a way that tells a story? So, um, for instance, we had, um, and this is a little bit different, kind of not off theme, but it was still within theme, but we actually told the story of one of the young women that you were going to be hearing from at the event. She was a young woman that had been adopted um, through the program. She was in foster care. And so we kind of teased her story in those three pieces that you were going to get the rest of it at the mm-hmm. event. So it became, and for us, the, what did we want in that last reminder mailing, we wanted people to not say, you know what, I don't need to go to this event. We wanted that last reminder to be, this is why you don't want to miss the event. Why? One, because there is a young girl who's going to be telling her story. Please bear witness to that. It's going to be a beautiful thing. You know, but three, you want to know what happens, right? Yeah. Like, so, so part of it was teasing that out. But I think that anytime you're going to get an invitation in the mail, if it's not going to be exciting in some way, or it just looks like that one-off branded thing, um, then you're not, you're just as a, as a person, you're just not going to be like, oh, what is this? I always like to say when it comes to um, what you're putting in people's mailboxes, there has to be some intrigue to it, um, especially when it comes to events. So really, if all it was, um, was, and this could be the save the date, if all it was, was just a quick, um, you're not going to believe what's going to happen in no- on November 4th, dot, 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 and there's a QR code, if that's it, I want to know what's going to happen, on <laughs> you know, and what's with all these like monstera leaves and what's going on. What's this greenhouse in the background of this picture? Like I need to know more. Right. Therefore I'm going to go ahead and, you know, take my phone and get that QR code and look, we're raising money for department of life sciences. And we're having this amazing plantology like kind of event that's happening in the form of a gala or a luncheon or something that's going to happen at the university greenhouse. Like it becomes much more interesting um, in terms of people wanting to lean into what you're sending. And I will also say too, because I think this is important, pay attention to the stamp that you're using. <laughs> We're in such a day and age where, you know, if you're going to have a kind of a, um, there was one event that we did for college um, first time, um, first generation college students. It was a, a nonprofit. So we did this like Route 66 theme. And the whole point about that was adventure awaits and how, we land all over the United States, some internationally in terms of the college they choose. So one of the things that um, we, oh gosh, you guys, I totally lost my train of thought. Oh, darn it. Um, what, where was I going with that? The stamp. Stamp choice. The stamp, Route 66. yeah. So one of the things that we did is we made the stamp because you can make these now, right? You want to make sure that the stamp looks like like one of those old shell gasoline like mm, uh-huh. like signs. But like you can do things so that it's just, immediately if I get it, I just think to myself, well, this is something creative. This is something different. And I want to know more. And that's the whole point of your event invitations is I want to know more. Okay. Uh, I want to know more then. Mm -hmm. I want to know the questions that we get asked the most by guests that show up, you know, in invitations or in FAQs always have to do with how do I show up? Like, how do I participate in this? So yeah. folks are always curious about attire. That is like the number one question. So I want to know for your explorer themed Emerald City uh, treasure hunt, what was the attire? How did people come dress for that event? So I want to tell you this. So we, over the years, um, had trained our donors very well and our attendees that we go all out with theme. So whether it is sort of kind of a, we did like a night circus theme one time. We did a Moulin Rouge theme one time. Um, We did, and I mean, these all relate back amazingly enough to the (laughs) theme that what we were raising money for that night. We did a Candyland theme um, when we were doing something for, yeah, for pediatrics care. All of it was, and we expected you to come, like what would Explore gear look like? Or if you were to arrive, like at 
at a gala in an Emerald City, what would you be wearing? So mm. many women wore green. I just remember like really the beautiful emerald green. People came with Indiana Joan hats in suits <laughs> like men. You know, it's just it runs the gamut. So I think a lot of times that, too, is and I love this question is it's so important that people feel comfortable yes. in what they're yeah. wearing. And I always, when it comes to event attire, what I always like to say is you may feel more comfortable if you're wearing a suit or something, you know, whatever, with a little bit of a whatever flair. You guys, the other thing about all of our events, we always had a place where you could get little props to uh, make sure that you kind of fit within the yeah. theme if you didn't bring anything and you Add felt the left theme out. theme here. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, for there was a point where I started to back off that actually in terms of um, just letting people know, like, come as you are. That's most important is um, you might, you know, like for a lot of, I would say, probably be more women, right? We're a little bit more, sometimes we get more worried about what other people are going to wear. Dudes are like, I'll just wear my suit. But for women, I just want to make sure you feel comfortable. So here's what you'll probably see other people wearing. But at the same time, like if you feel more comfortable in sweats and a cat sweater, I'm down with that. Like there's no reason why you should not come and not feel completely welcomed in that way too. Um, so, but we, we obviously just encouraged people to dress up um, in theme or out of theme, but whatever made them um, more comfortable, you know, cause they were going to be with us for a few hours. So I love it. Yeah. We are going to take a brief pause to thank some of our partners. And when we come back, I want to get into a little bit more of the fun, but also a little bit more of the tactics around the fun. We'll be right back. Loving the fundraising elevator, but wondering how you can talk to Sam and Kristen? Well, now's your chance to do it. Book one-on-one -on -one consulting time with Swain Strategies experts, Sam, Kristen, and Mary, and get all your event questions answered. Our team has you covered on strategic planning, fundraising strategy, storytelling, data tools, and registration support. Get the tools and the help you need to make the most impact at your fundraising event. Book at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. Welcome back. I'm excited to dive a little bit more into theme with Shannon and ask... We talked about when theme goes well with mission, <laughs> but conversely, what happens when the theme doesn't go so well? Well, I've never been part of those. So <laughs> I'm totally joking. Oh my gosh, friends. Okay. So, you know, I, I, that's such a great question. I think that hopefully it, here's the thing about fundraising and just in general, what we do podcast friends, right? We normally have gut feelings around things and Here's my just advice to you. Trust the gut feeling mm. so that if your board member is like, you know what? I went to a really amazing casino night like two years ago at my like in whatever event. And I think we should do something like that. If in your mind you're thinking, no, <laughs> just <laughs> no. Um, and that is the one theme I can never make work, um, by the way, which so I've never done it. Um, that's probably a good sign that it's just your gut check around your mission and who you are is probably that's not going to be a good theme for you. Um, because things can go pretty wonky. I think the other things, too, is when you um, go too far down into a theme, mm -hmm. like you get like, let's say you're like, oh, like I want to do um, like I for us, like. We did kind of a, it was a Moulin Rouge, which I talked about earlier. I'm trying to think of something I've talked about before. We did a Moulin Rouge theme. It was a point where you could go too far into it. Yes. So, you know, one <laughs> of the things that we did was we were like, oh, we're going to have this phenomenal dance break where we take basically these dancers from a local university and recreate one of the scenes from the movies. Mm -hmm. And believe me, we did it. But that was the hardest thing. And I don't think it added anything mm -hmm. to the event. So I think it's when you can get too far into it versus it just being sort of a thematic structure that can tell more about your storytelling in general. Um, so and, and I think the, two, the three of us have talked about it. It's also the flavor of the month themes, right. or I would oh. like to say the flavor of the month years. It's when it's just like, can I get the fire breather? Can I get the aerialist? Can I get the, you know, the eight course meals with the wine pairings and the things that everyone seems to be doing? And if it doesn't make sense to who you are, then 
I wouldn't be doing them. Um, I was recently um, talking with an organization that does schools, like they they build schools in Guatemala. So they were trying to think of event themes and they were kind of all over the place, but they're like, what about an under the sea theme and all of these like, you know, things that they think are just easy for people to gravitate towards. And I was like, but so tell me more about what happens in Guatemala. Like what are sort of the, you talk about these women and the crafts, what crafts are they doing? And they just started talking about these weavings and these textiles. And I was like, why don't, why don't you have your theme be around tapestry, like, and send people the actual threads that these women use in the invitation, right? So like, and it's about weaving a, a, a better future, like that be a theme that really relates to what you're doing versus the themes that you might think are maybe fun or let's get all the food trucks together um, <laughs> and do something around that because that's what everyone else is doing. Um, if it doesn't necessarily relate back to the story that you want to tell or how it manages to move your mission forward or really give people a, a desire to give to you, then you're you're kind of on the wrong track. Um, and you just don't want to be spending your time there for sure. It's or funny. Or your money. Or your money. <laughs> it's funny that you yeah. tap into these like zeitgeist cultural yeah. sort of, it's like there's this wave that happens where all of a sudden there's just like an in, you know, trendy thing that everyone wants to do and you have to keep coming back to how is this going to tell our story how is this going to help us sort of evolve our mission but the aerialists were literally two years worth of every event we did mm -hmm. there was a request about aerialists and um, we've been supporting one of our event partners on opening a new venue and we're like do you have aerialist hang points? <laughs> and they're like, what? I'm like, you will need them. The food trucks is very much the trendy thing now too. So it's time that we innovate and create some new new ideas along the way on themes. Um, but you mentioned a couple of things just now that I want to come back to, which are those little moments of uh, something someone wasn't expecting, like the threads in the invitation. Yeah, that's so great. You told us another example of like an unexpected surprise and delight that was in the Emerald City event. Can you talk a little bit about sort of your philosophy and how you pull uh, surprise and delight through your themes? Absolutely. So I think that... Um, the one thing that I always like to talk about, you know, fundraisers or just anyone that's that's in our industry is there is so much to be said about thoughtfulness and intention in what you do, which is why when it kind of comes to theme, I mean, sometimes this could feel um, kind of fluffy in terms of like, yeah, some theme, but there is so much intention and thoughtfulness around choosing the right theme and how it can resonate or better empower the storytelling that you're going to do at your event. I think of it the same way when it comes to guest experience. Mm -hmm. And I know you too, and uh, I know Swain Strategies in general is a powerhouse in this regards, but there is so much, it's a gift that your donors, supporters, new new time, atten first time attendees give you in terms of their time yeah. by showing yeah. up at your event. And I always want to honor that in some way, um, if I can, by doing a little bit of surprise and delight. Um, I have so many examples of, of how, how to do this um, and how I've done this before, but like, let's just take a first time attendee. For, yeah, um, so I had gone to an event one year where the next year they asked me to come on and help them with it. And as a first timer, I was completely lost when I got there. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was really tight. Res res I mean, going through registration felt like super quick. I didn't know what to do. I was with my husband. Um, I was like, okay, well, let's go grab a drink. And the line to, for to get a drink was so long. And when they brought me on the, to help the second, the next year, the one thing I said is, what were you guys doing like in this room, just right over here? And they're like, oh, that was just kind of a storage room. And I was like, let's try something different for your first time <laughs> attendees. So when you know, because you know, in terms of your database, right, who is going to be a first time attendee, what we did is if this was your first time and you checked in and you were flagged as a first time attendee, we had so many volunteers that we had a volunteers behind registration that would then take a first time attendee to a, the first time attendee room where that person would just <laughs> welcome them and there was no line for drinks. Oh, so that dreamy. person would walk up to the 
that we had three different bars available that then opened up later in the night. Right. But yeah. this was really for, Hey, we don't want you to have to stand in line. Like, do you have questions for us? Let me give you the lay of the land. You're going to see some tables. There's going to be things on them, but it was someone to sort of orient and just say, and say in script and just thank you. We know this is your first time with us. And so anything that we can do throughout the night, please come to us at registration or, um, if there's any feedback that you want to give us after, this is all about making your experience amazing because you potentially are going to be part of our generosity family. And we just want to know that you're well taken care of and that it matters to us. Right. So something like that, that's a surprise that you don't expect as a first time attendee. Right. <laughs> it's true. Um, it's, it's totally true. Another thing that we did at a golf tournament that this is one of my favorites that I did. Um, was if you don't know golf, that's okay. There's 18 holes. There's a back, <laughs> there's a front nine and a back nine. And usually at the turn, which is when you go into hole 10, 10 through 18, your golfers are a little tired or they've been maybe drinking a little bit and they're just kind of goofy. <laughs> maybe so a little bit. Maybe what we did at hole 10 is it was for it was for a bereavement program that young children went through when they lost a parent or a sibling. And one of the programs that they had was an art program. So what we did is we had um, our um, the children in that program actually decorate, draw art on golf balls. So oh. that at turn nine, when you came around, the whole point, you guys, if you, unless you're a crazy golfer, you've <laughs> lost a few balls on your way, <laughs> on your way to the turn. Um, so what we did is we had these balls that we gave to each foursome. So we, and we had a story behind that ball, like this ball, these balls were created by Sarah just for your foursome. Um, and Sarah loves this. And because of you, Sarah gets to have these programs and she wants you to know that she wants you to use them. Don't keep them, let it fly, you know, just mm -hmm. like you're just letting her fly in new ways. Right. So there's a story to it, but, the, but, to watch these dudes and some men and some women too, anyone, honestly, that were hitting these balls, the delight on these, their faces as they hit these balls on the back nine was phenomenal. And even the faces where um, they lost the ball, like oh. they just completely, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> um, but still, but I mean, and how important it was for them to find the ball, you know, it just, yeah. It just becomes this little surprise and delight that you're just not, you're not used to. Um, one other way too, um, is just knowing like, what if you were, um, if you were hosting an event at your house and you had your guests, like what is your signature drink? What would you do? One of our table captains who had been a longtime table captain had this very special, um, it wasn't like pomegranate. I think that's kind of newer, but it was this sparkling cider like this um, that he made for everybody um, because it for him, they didn't drink alcohol. So it was kind of his, like that was him and his wife's favorite drink to offer people. And so we actually made that for everybody at his table. So that when you sat down, that was the, that was your drink that you got as a, kind of from him. And he was like, I cannot believe I this, but it was like, you know what, there's more than enough wine and everything available, but we wanted to make sure that for those guests that are non-alcoholic, we have something special for you too. And so I, I, I could go on and on. Oh, one other <laughs> one. I'll give you one more. The, oh, the places you'll go. So one of the things that we did during that event that was very special is we had book plates made and the book plates are kind of that sticker that you put on the inside of a book that an author can sign their name. And so we had every guest write their wish for a reader mm. on one of those book plates. What we then did is we put all of those book plates into new books that we had just um, been donated by a large corporation in the organization that went out to the schools where these programs were. Um, so it was just this beautiful, like, if a child opens a book, they're going to see this little empowering, wonderful message from somebody. So what we did is we had the kids do that in reverse for some of our table captains or oh, um, cool. first time donors so that you received your own book plate for the wish that they had for you. And they were so cute because it's like little kids who have no idea, like, what, what would I wish for somebody? It was like, well, what do you wish for your mom? You know, that she, that she gets a massage and has a really good day. Like, so, I mean, these, these were the kind of messages that people were receiving and that, that closing of that loop, it was beautiful. So people just don't expect, right. Um, they don't Things expect like to be that? seen. Yeah. And that's, like, the, then that's, at the, that's what's the heart of all of those is how as human beings we can see each other and in yes. that experience come together and close that gap. 
Absolutely. And I think it's, it's so important. I think that when you think about, and I mean, we're kind of, we know this too about storytelling in general and how storytelling works, but we also know this about dopamine and all these other things Mm -hmm. that happen scientifically with ourselves. But those moments of delight, that is the resonance. That is the emotional connection that happens. Um, So that's why it's always important to me when you're at an event, for instance, we did one for, um, Um, If you guys know the programs that serve a lot of girls who learn how to run their first 5K um, at that event for most of those organizations, a lot of them um, having the girls wear capes during their first 5k is a big deal so for an event that we did for about 180 donors at the very end of the night um there was a group of girls that came up on stage and they're like and uh and taped underneath their seat was like just a little bag and everyone had a cape oh my gosh everyone so good their capes on together and they did this cheer that they all learned together um going through the program they did that for everybody there um and so that was kind of the end to the night was everybody had their capes um, because we all crossed that finish line together that night so there's delight in that there's Mm -hmm. just there's shared experience in that uh for sure you guys can tell i get super hyped about this i'll give you (laughs) one one last one last thing yeah um because this is for any of you that do events So many of your um, events, right? And a lot of times they are people that have been to your event before. They were there the year before. Um, One of the things that I like to do that's not in the program um, is at the very end of the night, as you're saying good night and thank you, um, you've got screens or you've got things that are that are happening usually. So what you can do is you can just say, um, if everyone could just take a look at the screens right now, we're going to put some names up there. And let's say it's... um, 83 people that were there the year before. And what then we did was we had a young gentleman come up who in that college program had just, it was just in his first year of college, was finishing up his first year. And his message as he came up, he said, well, I just want to thank everyone here tonight um, because I know what's going to happen and, you know, how your generosity is going to feel other kids like me. But I specifically too want to say thank you to these 83 people that were here last year, because if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be finishing my very first year. Oh, so good. So okay. Good. So, yep. So that is this moment of surprise. It's this moment of, right. Um, th- that one still gives me goosies. Um, but I think that if everyone could do something like that, I mean, take some ideas, steal them, replicate them, go with them. They're, they're <laughs> phenomenal. But that moment of just like you both said, I'm seen, I mattered. Yeah. I made a difference. Yeah. Um, just gives you the hope and the desire to keep doing it. Well, I think you're pulling another theme through, which is the importance of storytelling, which is where we all overlap and believe so strongly mm. in the power of storytelling. So we're going to take a pause and come and hear a story from one of our partners. But when we come back, I want to know more about the books over your shoulder, because I think they're all incredible resources that should be shared. So we'll be back in just a minute. <laughs> believe in bringing people together. Our online learning platform for fundraising events has webinars, workshops, downloadable tools, and more designed to save you time and stress when planning your next event. We're getting nonprofit, development, and event planning professionals the tools and ideas they need to create events that inspire donors and raise more money. So join us at elevatenonprofit.com. The link is also in our show notes. All right. Well, I want to ask you about tips for picking a good theme. And I want to specifically ask you about the nonprofit storytelling conference themes, because you do incredible themes in your work with Chris Davenport and planning the nonprofit storytelling conference. And themes don't just have to be for galas. They can be for all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, how do you pick your theme every year for the conference? And, you know, what we all want to know, what's this year's theme? Okay, I'm going to give you some secret tech on how we do this. Um, (laughs) Honestly, it's like any other theme, I think, when uh, you kind of pick the one that just you want to be working on. It's the one that you are like, oh, I could get I could get excited around this one. The other thing is knowing your audience. So um, 
for us when we think about storytelling conference and the theme that we want to do, um, you know, how can the theme work in ways to really encourage the work that they're doing? You, podcast friends specifically, you know, are doing on a daily basis and whether that theme would resonate with you. Sometimes it's also very personal. I mean, we did a space theme one year um, and really that was because the opening story that we told was around our executive producer, Chris Davenport, and the fact that his um, his dad was one of the main engineers around the backpack that the first astronauts wore um, to get to the moon. And so part of was that was we knew we wanted to tell that story because we knew how that would resonate specifically with the work that we felt that people were doing and how important it was. Um, and how could we incorporate that story in a way to make a theme come alive, like over the next three days? So that was one of them. Um, we've done a lot of just fun ones over the year. This year is we're doing Storytellers Island. <laughs> so <laughs> this one's really fun. We want it because we're in San Diego and it's rarely, right? Rare sometimes you go to a place where it's always kind of just sunny and wonderful. And so we just really wanted to play with that theme. Um, but also just kind of what gets, what happens when, if you were to get together on an island with amazing storytellers or active volcanoes. Um, that is a secret to something that's going to be happening at the event. Um, but what happens when you guys all, kind of all get together and what would happen on a storyteller's island? So, you know, kind of inspired by Gilligan's Island, a little bit of Lost, a little bit of whatever, right, is here we all, we're all in this together. Like the whole goal of usually an island is you all want to get off of it together in one piece. <laughs> so how do we do that in a way where we can do that as a community where we are learning not only from people that have skills that come onto the island to help us, but also how do we use our own collective genius of everyone that's in the room to help propel others to get to the place where we need to go. So we really are leaning into that. Um, and one of the fun things that we're doing too is like, cause again, this is where a theme can help you think differently. So we're like, okay, so many of us come to an event and, or a conference, and maybe you have a gift that you can give to somebody. Maybe you're not on stage like a Kristen or a Sam, but you have as much knowledge, but and there's someone there that needs that knowledge. So how do we connect you? So we're going to have like a coconut board where <laughs> one half of the coconut is something you can offer to people. And the other half of the coconut is something that you need. I need this. Mm -hmm. I can give this. And then our volunteers are going to put the coconuts together on a big board <laughs> so we can help people connect to each other that need help um, on an item. So kind of like that give and take, but how do you do that in a community? But well, we wouldn't have thought that until someone was like, oh, we have to have coconuts. And then I thought, what can we do with coconuts? Oh, we can put the, we, you have to put them together. So anyways, that's how my brain thinks. Um, but essentially it's really what we, what we think that would get people excited. And we are big into illustration as well, yeah. which we also just think brings some fun into it. So we knew that, Usually when we pick a theme, we want it to have some creature or like furry creatures or things that we can sort of personalize or personify. <laughs> so of course, yes. if we're going to be on an island, we have to have monkeys. Um, <laughs> and so we have some very cute things that are happening there. But, but will anyways. there be a finger puppet monkey? Because I still have several of my other finger puppets from past conferences. <laughs> I can't give everything away. But there, <laughs> there may be. Yeah. There may and be. I mean, and also too, like you want to have walk up tiki huts right just kind of like the the sally five cent psychiatry thing right but you want to like we thought how could we use tiki huts and let's put an expert behind a tiki hut and then people walk up and ask a question you know a way to kind of get in front of speakers a little bit more so yeah we just we kind of have fun with it but the whole the whole point of it is this i think too around a theme is a theme also the amount of thought that you put into it also shows up in the way that a person experiences it yeah and so if you put that love and that care and that thought into, well, how would a person want this? And why would they want to fill out a coconut? Or why would they have, why would be throwing stuffed monkeys at people? Like when you think about all of these things, it's because at the end of the day, it's really about the experience that you're trying to give your, your guest, your supporter, your attendee, your donor. Um, and if you put as much care into it and thought, they'll feel it. Yeah. They'll see it. And that, again, goes a long way in terms of just that experiential um, resonance that happens and why people continue to come back to you and why we are successful at the conference and having people come back year and year because it's it's a 
you just feel like you belong. You feel like you, yeah. Well, I I think the other thing to consider too when thinking about, I'm thinking about sort of conferences specifically, you have duration, yes. right? So you have folks for multiple days yeah. sometimes and mm-hmm. duration. And instead of seeing that as a like, oh my gosh, we <laughs> how do we play this out? You all really see that as an opportunity and that mm-hmm. surprise and delight happening sort of over time as well, I think becomes a really amazing opportunity to think about for your guests. Yeah. Well, it I also said- helps on, oh, sorry, I was going to say, it also helps on a marketing promotion side. If you're trying to get people to come to your event, one of the things that we just launched a couple of weeks ago is we now have a conference beach towel <laughs> that we've been giving away and people are going like, you know, Go go or whatever that is, cuckoo puffs, whatever that thing is. You know, they're just they're loving it, and the chance to win a towel, and that the towel is showing up everywhere over social media. People are like, "What is this towel? What are people talking about? Why are they why are they talking about this?" It's it gives you something to play with if you want other people to word of mouth of your event or just talk more about what you're doing as well, so people people can find you. Yeah. Well, it's all part of that theme of storytelling and how important that is and, and how we weave stories together. So I said to our listeners, I wanted to know more about the book sh- the books on your bookshelf because I think that it's important to share resources and you have some great books. Can you recommend what or share with our listeners what you have over your shoulder so yeah. we can give them a little so recommended reading? <laughs> Absolutely. And it's funny because I always change these books out like when I'm ever doing one of these things. So these <laughs> things are great. So this is one that you just, if you're just kind of new to storytelling in general and you want to know like why is it important why does it matter so this one storytelling how stories make us human um this is by jonathan gottschalk i don't know how to say his last name but i think that's it um this is just phenomenal it's kind of like a quick sort of evolutionary way the way that story has evolved and how we um, connect with it in terms of our brain there is a theme actually that i looked in all three of these it's all about neuroscience Uh so if you aren't getting nerdy into like neuroscience and the way that our brain works um these books are really fabulous introductions to it this one was one of my favorites and it's not like a fundraising book it's just called empathy Um, why it matters and how to get it. I think when you want to resonate um, and how to create extraordinary moments with people in terms of feeling seen exactly what we talked about, you have to work your empathy muscle. Um, Mm -hmm. And if you, um, and because it's a way of connecting um, that puts you in a different person's shoes or has you thinking about them in a much more compassionate, different way. This is this is a great book. Plus, I think the more empathetic you are in terms of using that muscle, actually a better, deeper, more meaningful storyteller you yeah. are. And then this last one is Emotion Raising by Francesco Ambergetti. If you are in the fundraising world and you don't have this book, you need to get it. Um, Frankie, um, who has worked at UNICEF um, for so many years, has cr- amazing, amazing amounts of um, information about um, how our brain works with emotion and how to specifically use emotion in it tactfully. So lots of different tactics in your in your fundraising storytelling that will actually make people more likely to give. And I have to tell you something that's very special about the conference this year. Um there is um, a doctor, kind of a neuroscience. He's he just wrote a book called Immersion about a year ago. His name is Dr. Paul Zak. He's phenomenal. Just look him up. We love him Paul and Frankie Zach's work. Are actually doing a session together this year at Storytelling. That's awesome. Uh, Dr. Zach has never been in front of a nonprofit audience like this before, and he, in terms of immersion and how the brain works on storytelling, um, he's one of the most sought after people. Like internationally Um, so the fact that him and frankie are going to be on stage and we're going to watch it in real time how your brain is working because we have the technology in the room to do that is just going to be a brand new experience for people so all of these books are great um just in general i like to say that when it comes to fundraising that you are a storyteller um you are and that is your greatest gift um we believe at storytelling conference that um, the most influential person is a great storyteller and that all of you and all of us um, in fundraising this is what we do on a daily basis but a lot of times we can get taken out of that space of story because we're really focused on the day-to-day or the things that need to happen. Yeah. But every now and then picking up a book or watching a good movie or even watching a little YouTube short on story will get you back in that place where you're like, 
it's really about how do I connect to other humans? And the best way to do that is through story and inviting them to tell us their story as well, which is why when it comes to an event invitation, don't only speak at people, ask them a question and have them write that in their RSV back to you. So whether they're doing that online, like let's say you're doing a, you know, you're doing a, um, a literary event, like in it, ask them as they RSVP, what was your favorite book as a child? You know, and that becomes a story that you can start to have with them about, I oh, that. I saw that that was mine too, or that was my board members too. Like, what do you remember about it? Just make sure that you're also inviting them into sharing story as well um, as part of your event. So, okay. I'm adding questions to invitations. Yep. Oh, I yeah. have another book yeah. I need to go buy because I have not... T- read Frankie's book. So I need to go buy that. So yep. good. Well, let's go so for good. a ride on the elevator. Let's Kristen. Do it. So um, <laughs> we always invite our guests on to the fundraising elevator and we're going to go up to the penthouse. And I would love for you to tell us a little bit about um, a great event you've been to and why. What made mm. it great? What made it great? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'm, I'm going to throw you guys for a little loop. Do it. And I'm. it's not going to be, it's going to be an event, but not an event. So it's not a gala event, but I think it has or a, a fundraising event yeah. recently. It's going to be something that I think speaks to something I want more people to be thinking about. Okay. And that is Pacific Northwest people. Two years ago, Seattle got its first hockey team. Um, and we, we are huge hockey people in this family. And I want to tell you, we went to playoff hockey this last year. And what the for us it's the seattle kraken Uh okay Mm -hmm. what the kraken organization did pre-show to get this entire audience of eighteen thousand people hyped and excited and all in on cheering a team and believing 100 that we were going to win this darn thing and we were going to bring that energy that's the kind of thought that i want people to have when they are thinking about their event and here's why In sports, there is so much, it's, I just call it the lower deck versus upper deck effect. And I think it happens in the way that we do events. You've got people in your first two rows and then you've got everybody in the back, Mm -hmm. you know, or you have people that just are not going to have that same experience that other people who are maybe closer to the stage don't get to have. How do you make sure that every single person in that room feels like they're wanted Hmm, You want them to be there. How do you get them excited? Whether it's everybody with a blinky bracelet, whether it's everybody that gets the same rally towel, um, whether it's when you are specifically, you got someone on ice that's talking, he's talking to the people up there and he's pointing and he's doing thing. It's how do you create this atmosphere where you don't feel like you are a second class citizen to other people that are in the room? And I would say that for me, from a gathering perspective, that is something that I just think about um, because um, and I know I know that that organization, too, even as you, we were going out, the fact that they had different ushers, different people giving high fives to people. These were all That's thoughts awesome. that they had yeah. about how do we make sure that people are fully immersed in this experience and that. I want to say lately has probably been one of the best experiences because I wasn't expecting it. And I wasn't expecting um, me to feel to a person that I could look down my row and would never see again in my life to have this moment of like, like high-fiving and like, you know, doing this crazy towel thing they had us do with each other. It was this moment of connection between people in a room, in a, in a room for like in an arena full of 20,000 people, they were able to figure out how do I get that person in row 18, row F to connect with the person five seats down from them in a way that's going to, they're going to remember. That's going to be all about cracking hockey down the road. So I, love uh, it. I don't know if that's like helpful, yeah. but it just, it really, it gets me thinking a lot of times when um, you think about the people in the back of the room, when you even think about, and you know this where, okay, well, I'm, I can't afford that much on AV. So maybe the sound's going to be a little bit crappier in the back, but that's okay. It's not okay. It's not it's okay. Absolutely not okay. Or you know what? I can't. I can't figure out the two screw the putting four screens in around a room. But that person's not going to be able to see. But you know what? It's fine. It's fine. It's just. It's what it is. No, it's no. not. Yeah. That stage. That stage in the middle, so that everyone has a chance to see. It's. 
it's it's that kind of stuff you know you guys yeah. know this as well as i do but um i just think in general thinking about how do we make sure everyone has a great experience um, whether it's through that surprise and delight or whether it's through a theme, but that everybody feels like you are seen, like absolutely 100% the impact of you being here and giving us your time matters no matter where you're seated. Um, making people feel that way is what I think makes an event pretty special and what I felt recently that made me just feel like, yeah, this is it. This is the sauce. This is it. I think that sauce is something that we're seeing a lot. Well, I, I've been down the rabbit hole of social media. We're seeing a lot in the Taylor Swift tour that's happening, mm -hmm. the Eris concert tour. Um, in that, the yeah, the bracelets, bracelets and, the mm -hmm. like she gives everyone the glowing bracelets. So then it creates patterns in the audience. There's exchange okay. of bracelets happening that people are creating bracelets and giving away bracelets. There's the mm -hmm. chance that people are doing that idea of like everyone in a crowd, no matter how big, being connected and being a part of something is a really powerful impact of bringing people together and gathering in this way. All right, I derailed yeah. us from the elevator. Yeah, so um, <laughs> let's jump back in the elevator. Let's go down to the basement where all the tools live. If you had to name the biggest tool you think fundraisers need in their toolkit, what is it? Oh, man. Not to put you on the spot. Oh, we stumped her. Well, it's a hard one. It is. Okay, just from a, I'll give you a tactical because I've been, I've been saying this for a long time, especially if you're in, in the event world. Can I just give you one tactic? Yeah. One thing that I think all of you should know and do, and that is for every first time donor, first time event attendee that comes to your event, they are the first person you prioritize to get a thank you call. Mm, um, nice. The amount in terms of not just retention, but just overall goodwill that you will create for a brand new donor supporter of yours by having them be the first thank you call you make is immense. And I've seen it in the 20 years that I've been doing this. So that's from a tactical, I think you need to know that. I think you need to be telling your board members and your other fundraising staff or other people like, we're gonna make thank you calls and this is who we're gonna target specifically um, because that's gonna pay dividends, dividends in terms of long-term um, just long-term for you guys. Um, in terms of just what I think that they need, gosh, this feels very Ted Lasso, but I just <laughs> think you need belief. I just think you need to believe and, and trust your gut um, so much. And I, and I wonder if you guys get to have these conversations, especially with younger favorite fundraisers who are just kind of, kind of questioning, like, am I, do I have enough experience to be able to tell a board or tell my new director that this is the way that we should be going with this event theme or should I be this or that? And I mean, it's just pure like, yes, if there's anyone that you need to hear it from, let it be from me, Sam and Kristen today. Yes, you bring so much unique um, perspective uh, to what you do and you were hired for that specific reason. Sometimes our managers forget that. Let's, let's remind them why. But it's just belief that you're in the right place and you're meant to be there. And your ideas are just as good, if not better, <laughs> than the other ones that are that are coming through. So um, just really, it's not about confidence for me. It's more just like, just keep believing that you're in the right place and you're meant to do really great things where you are. You were called to do it and good things are going to happen with you, with you doing what you're doing. Yeah. I love that. I love the Ted Lasso moment. Mm -hmm. We all need a Ted Lasso it's moment. True. Well, I'll hit the... Let's all yes. hit the belief sign. Yeah, on the way hit out. the belief yeah. sign. Well, Shannon, yeah. you are just like the most sort of kind, big hearted, loving human in this world. We're so grateful for you. And we're so grateful for just the like inspiration and insight that you bring to the sector. Thank you for all your work on the nonprofit storytelling conference. If folks want to join this big giant family love fest, that is the nonprofit sector coming together to learn about storytelling, how can they find out more about the conference? Love that. And we would love to see you. Um, Nonprofitstorytellingconference.com. There's also something that we put together for our new podcast friends. Um, and that is if you struggle with themes, uh, we put together a really cool resource that I know that um, Sam and Kristen will have available th for you through show notes. And it's called the Gala Theme Goldmine. And if you're an organization that's like, I don't know, I'm an arts organization or I'm a something and I just need help, We've got themes for you that you can react to and just kind of play with. So that's a resource that we're making available to you that's totally free. It's a cool new book. Um, so check that out if you think it will be helpful. But otherwise, um, yes, yeah, Storytelling Conference is pretty special. Um, and the reason why is because of the two other people that I'm talking with today who have been there with us um, from the beginning. And uh, we would just love to have you there. And we would love to be show you kind of what hospitality and event experience looks like in a way that's intentional and super thoughtful. 
So yeah, come visit us if you want. Awesome. Well, we hope to see everyone in San Diego. Yes. And in the meantime, we will link all of these amazing resources in the show notes. Your book recommendations. We'll put a reference to some of Paul Zach's work because we reference his work all the time in our in our teaching and in our event planning world. And then we'll make sure that there's the free download and a link to register for the Nonprofit Storytelling Conference. So Shannon Doolittle, thank you for just bringing your heart every time. We appreciate yep. you. Well, and thank you. I love being in this elevator with you and all the <laughs> other new podcast friends that are here. And as always, just thank you for your service to this particular community and to this community. Keep going. You inspire, I know, Kristen, Sam, and myself on a daily basis. And uh, we just we just love that you're here with the same amount of heart as we are. And keep doing what you're doing. You're doing amazing work. Thank Thanks you. for joining us today. Bye, friends. Thank you. The Fundraising Elevator is produced in partnership with Swaim Strategies at the studios of the AV department. The program is produced by April Clark and directed by Steve Osborne, with audio engineering and original music by Dwayne Anderson and Heidi Christensen. Video production by Chris Peterson, Whitney Gomes, and Nathan Bouquet. Video editing by Steve Osborne. Graphic design by Pendulum Creative Group. And support from Sophia Keller, John Lyles, and Andy Dowsett.